Good morning. I'm Erika de la Garza, the Baker Institute Latin Program Director of the Latin American Initiative. And before introducing our next speaker, I'd like uh, to mention that he's here for this important conference as well as to be part of a lecture series called Mexicans Look at Mexico, which is co-sponsored by the Humanities Research Center at Rice and the Baker Institute's Latin American Initiative. In the lecture series, we've looked at um, education and economic development. Today, we'll be looking at energy. And in the next couple of weeks, we will be discussing immigration and Mexican art and culture. I'd like to thank Amy Jaffe and her staff for putting this wonderful event together, and especially Moramay Lopez Alonso from the Humanities Research Center, uh, whose help has been invaluable in putting the lecture series together. It is my pleasure this morning to introduce Francisco Salazar, who is the president of the Mexican Energy Regulatory Commission. He's been in this position since 2005. Uh, Mr. Salazar has had a distinguished career serving his country as federal deputy for his home state, San Luis Potosí, in two different occasions, as well as he served on several different uh, commissions. He is a chemical engineer with a master's in public finance and global market economics from the London School of Economics, and he has been recognized as one of Mexico's most uh, prominent young professionals. Please help me introduce, uh, welcome uh, Francisco Salazar. Thank you very much, Erica. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. It's nice to see you again. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Baker Institute uh, for the invitation. And uh, since uh, I understand that uh, we are late and that uh, uh, we are supposed to finish by 9.15 or 10.15, uh, I have a, a very short time. So what I'll do is I'll try to go very quickly through the presentation. Uh, you'll, you'll keep a copy here, so in case you need to... Uh, go into the details of uh, some of the slides that I will be talking about. Uh, of course, you can do it, and uh, if you want to make further questions to the ones that uh, uh, we will be able to answer during uh, or after my presentation, of course, I will be here the rest of the day. Okay, let me start by describing what is the legal framework uh, for policy making in the energy sector in Mexico. First, that uh, we have the Constitution. Uh, there are three articles in the Constitution that talk about the energy sector. Uh, those are the 25th, the 27th, and the 28th. Uh, from the Constitution, you, can, uh, you have uh, in a second uh, level uh, three main uh, acts that uh, 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 are uh, the basic uh, legal framework. You, you have, uh, we have the Hydrocarbons Act, or Ley Reglamentaria Articulo 27. We have the CRE Act, or uh, it's the Act of the uh, Regulatory Energy Commission and we have the Pemex Act. And after that, we also have a, a general uh, regulation framework, which is issued by the ministry, and then we have uh, the directives, the orders, and the resolution that uh, are issued by the CRE. Of course, what this means is that any um, major uh, policy change has to be done by the Congress, because they are the ones that uh, issue the, the uh, changes or it can amend the Constitution or issue new laws. So any change has to go uh, through the Congress. And within the executive branch, uh, we have uh, three kinds of uh, agency or three kinds of actors. We have, uh, of course, the uh, ministry or CENER. They are in charge of uh, policy making within the uh, legal framework. They also do some planning, and uh, they also establish some standards, some technical regulation. We have the operators. Uh, Mexico has uh, three large state-owned uh, companies in the uh, energy sector. We have Pemex, which is uh, in the uh, hydrocarbons business, and we have CFE and uh, Lucy Fuerza del Centro, which are the uh, electricity utilities. And, of course, uh, there's... Uh, the uh, regulator, uh, which is the CRE, and uh, we are uh, responsible for uh, mostly economic regulation, also, although we also do some uh, technical regulation. In uh, 1995, uh, the Congress passed uh, the last uh, major reform that was done to the energy sector, and that reform basically consisted in opening the downstream activities within the natural gas market. They didn't open uh, the exploration, the production, the processing, 
and the, and the sales of the natural gas, of uh, locally produced natural gas. But uh, what, uh, what was opened was the uh, uh, transport, the distribution, the storage, and all the sales of uh, natural, natural gas. Of course, uh, imports were uh, allowed in the country. So uh, this was the last major reform that was done in the sector. Um, I think and I believe this uh, reform was successful. If you look at, of, at for instance, the number of uh, users in the distribution of natural gas, the amount has uh, more than tripled. If you look, for instance, in terms of uh, investment accumulated in the sector, uh, we're talking about $1.5 billion in distribution. Uh, in terms of um, uh, private open access pipelines uh, built in natural gas sector, we're talking about all, of almost uh, 3,000 kilometers uh, since 1997. Uh, the investment there is also uh, around uh, $1.5 uh, billion. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the reform was uh, pretty good. Uh, some of the things that were done uh, were pretty successful. But unfortunately, not all the things were uh, done well, or uh, some, uh, there are some pending issues after this reform. Of course, uh, I believe that uh, the upstream uh, has to be uh, open, that uh, we have to have uh, new incentives to promote more investment and competition, because one of the, uh, of the goals of, uh, or the objectives of the reform in 1995 was to uh, have Pemex focusing their uh, uh, the resources into exploration, but of course, uh, gas is not as profitable as, as oil, and so Pemex has devoted most, most of its uh, resources to oil. It hasn't uh, responded to the high prices in natural gas, so it hasn't been able to respond to the demand growth. And uh, so this is, I believe, uh, the major reform that has to be done, or the next step, if we want to have a more efficient uh, sector. Uh, in, in terms of transport, although uh, we have a, a model that was able to attract investment, uh, we still need to make uh, some changes to it in order to expand the system and to give redundancy to the system. After the explosions we have uh, several months ago, it's clear that uh, we have to, to have a different model that promotes investment in, in a more uh, – uh, uh, I mean, uh, more investment there. And some other changes that we have to do are institutional changes that have to deal uh, have to do with a, a coherent price framework in the sector. Because uh, although uh, the, the price framework for natural gas has been uh, uh, has been working very well, and uh, I have to say that uh, in uh, designing the price uh, framework, we have been working with people related with with the Rice University. We have Bob Rito here who has uh, helped us uh, with this. Uh, Juan Rosellón also that we'll be speaking later. Uh, we have a very good model that uh, uh, describes uh, how the price has to be set uh, in, in, uh, nat uh, for natural gas in Mexico. But the problem is that in uh, some other related sectors, we have uh, price controls. Uh, like, for instance, in the LPG sector, the government uh, has set uh, some price controls also in the fuel oil uh, sector. So uh, we have to have a coherent price framework. This is something that has to be done, has to be done. And of course, that is also related with the strengthening the regulator because sometimes uh, all the re regulation that we issue is, uh, is, no, um, is, of, is of no use because of this price control. So these are some things that have to be done. But uh, as, I was mentioning, as I was mentioning, uh, I believe that the reform uh, worked well, and uh, we can see it uh, in this graph. Uh, 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 what we have here is uh, what was the uh, behavior of the uh, natural gas demand uh, in, uh, f uh, after 1995 uh, when the reform was done. And as you can see, uh, the demand uh, grew uh, very rapidly, but unfortunately the production was not able to keep the pace, and that's because uh, Pemex was not able to have enough resources invested in upstream. And, of course, as you can see, the trade balance uh, changed a lot from that uh, because of that. And uh, m the main driver in natural gas consumption was electricity, the power sector. Of course, uh, uh, same as uh, the U.S. and same as uh, most countries, uh, Mexico looked uh, into natural gas to, uh, to produce more uh, electricity. So uh, 
the consumption of natural gas in the power sector grew uh, considerable well during these 10 years. Uh, during last year, uh, the demand was uh, uh, almost uh, or was more than 6.5 uh, BCFs uh, a day. Uh, of, of that, 48% uh, corresponded to the oil sector. Of course, that includes uh, reflows within the oil sector to produce oil. 35% of that uh, was related to the power sector, almost 15% to the industry, and 1.6% to the residential uh, sector. And um, uh, we expect the uh, demand to grow at an annual rate of uh, 3.9% over the next uh, 10 years. So. Uh, how to face this increase in demand? Of course, we have some integration with, uh, 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 with the United States, same as uh, the United States has uh, integration with Canada. But uh, the problem is that if we take a look at, the, uh, uh, at North, America and, uh, North America's gas picture, what we can see is that the United States, uh, as Ambassador was saying, is not a not any more self-sufficient. It's importing natural gas from Canada. So uh, Mexico ha has to do something about it because we cannot uh, uh, rely always on uh, U.S. Uh, uh, gas. So um, especially if, uh, if, if we are going to keep on growing uh, the consumption of natural gas in, in the power sector, as uh, it is the case, as you can see it here. Uh, uh, the problem with, uh, uh, with the consumption of natural gas in the power sector is that it will grow at a faster pace than uh, uh, the growth of uh, natural gas consumption. Uh, we'll have to add uh, 24 giga gigawatts of uh, new capacity, and most of it will be uh, uh, relying on natural gas. So uh, all of this, what implies is a 7.3 average annual growth rate of natural gas. So we have to do something about it. So what can we do to face this increase, uh, increasing demand? The first of all, uh, well, first of all, uh, we have to continue promoting private investment in uh, LNG. We have been able to uh, promote uh, investment there. Uh, we have to keep on uh, working on this, and we have to strengthen the pipeline infrastructure we have. Uh, Mexico will start exploding its coal bath methane reserves, fortunately. They are not very large. Uh, as a matter of fact, there are not uh, accurate numbers on, on the amounts of these reserves, but uh, this is something that uh, can be done right now. And uh, we have to continue insisting in uh, having Pemex focusing uh, their uh, uh, resources in investments of uh, a more production. So this is... Uh, uh, what the natural gas balance looks uh, in the next years. As you can see, most of the uh, gap will be filled with LNG. And uh, this is because, fortunately, uh, we have been able to issue some uh, good uh, uh, LNG regulation. Uh, in year 2002, when it was already clear that Mexico uh, had to rely on uh, some other sources, CRE published uh, uh, the first uh, standard for LNG plants, and uh, we received uh, five permits applications for uh, five different uh, LNG facilities. In uh, 2003, we granted the first LNG permit, and uh, then uh, two more permits were issued that year. And then on year 2004, we issued uh, or we published the final standard for LNG facilities. And uh, so far, we have issued or we have granted five LNG permits. Uh, of these five permits, uh, there are two which are already working. Well, three, let's say three, because uh, two of the projects, the, the, project, uh, the Shell project in uh, Baja, as well as the Sempra project in Baja were joined. Uh, so uh, those two uh, uh, permits uh, got into a single project. And uh, uh, this project, is, uh, I, I will show you in a few slides, will start operation uh, early next year. And uh, we also have the Shell project in Altamira that is already working. Uh, it started receiving uh, LNG uh, shipments uh, in year 2005. Two other projects, although they received our permit, uh, uh, those projects were canceled. The first one was a marathon project in uh, Tijuana, and uh, they were not able to obtain a construction permit from the local authorities, so they decided they didn't want to do it. And uh, after that, the Chevron Texaco, they had an offshore project, but uh, because the cost of uh, steel went up and because the uh, 
uh, Sampra and Shell project was already uh, being constructed, uh, they decided to cancel that, that project. Um, so basically, with uh, the uh, regulation we have, uh, uh, it is possible to attract investment, and uh, there are several ways in which the terminal developers can participate in the acquisition of LNG. They can either sign uh, uh, long-term contracts, which has been the case of uh, Altamira and uh, which will be the case of Manzanillo, or they can uh, uh, probably have a terminal that will receive spot cargoes, and uh, this is uh, something that is uh, being considered by some developers. This is the Mexico LNG map. As you can see, we have three terminals that are already installed. Uh, well, the Altamira facility and the Ensenada, the Sempra Shell uh, facility. And uh, after that, the, the, the other project that will be uh, constructed will be Manzanillo. That project it has to be ready by year 2011. And uh, two other projects that uh, will compete probably between themselves are Puerto Libertad and Topolobampo. And uh, two more projects in the uh, coast of the uh, Gulf of Mexico, the Matamoros and the Coatzacoalcos, they are offshore projects, and uh, another project is being considered in Yucatan. Uh, quickly, the terminal uh, uh, at Altamira has a capacity to gasify 0.5 uh, to 0.7 BCFs a day. This is started operations in the year 2006. Um, then also we have uh, Energia Costa Azul, the one, the project by Sempra. Uh, currently, it will have a, a capacity to regasify one BCF a day. It will start operations in the first quarter of uh, next year, but it will be expanded. We have just approved the expansion of the terminal, so it will be able to gasify 2.6 uh, BCFs a day in the next future. Uh, it will be connected uh, through a pipeline uh, to the United States, so. Although it will be uh, consuming uh, uh, or, or uh, it will be serving the Baja market, it will also be exporting a lot of uh, gas to the California market. And then we have a Manzanillo project. This is a project that is being pushed by CFE. Uh, CFE uh, has to uh, secure supplies to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, convert some of their plants into uh, 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 do some other new plants in the center of Mexico, so they need uh, natural gas. So what they have done is they have a, uh, they went into a bid, and uh, that bid was uh, awarded to Repsol uh, last September, and uh, the gas will come from Peru. Basically, uh, they have signed a long-term contract. The long-term contract uh, states that the price will be 0.91 uh, of the price at Henry Hub minus uh, three cents per million BTU, and uh, the uh, duration of the contract will be 15 years. This is the supply schedule. As you can see, uh, the plant will be receiving uh, 0.4 uh, BCFs uh, and, uh, during the first uh, stage of the project, and then it, after uh, uh, year 2015, it will have to have around 0.5 BCFs. This is where the terminal will be. And then we have the Puerto Libertad project. This is a project by uh, El Paso. Uh, uh, they have already uh, been granted the permits uh, from CERMERNAT, the environmental authority, and uh, they are considering to probably submit an application next year to, to the CRE. Uh, this uh, project will be serving uh, uh, some uh, consumption, C some CFE consumption in the state of Sonora, but also it will be serving Arizona's uh, market, uh, especially during the summer when they have a lot of uh, consumption of natural gas. Some other LNG products that we have are the offshore products. I, I guess they, should, they would be similar to the Energy Bridge uh, Gulf Gateway, uh, Gateway project uh, here in the Gulf of Mexico. Those would be linked to two underground storage uh, uh, projects, one in the state of Veracruz, the other one in the state of Tamaulipas and the Topolobampo project in Sinaloa, and the uh, project in Yucatan. Of course, uh, what, what we can see here is that uh, some of these projects will require more uh, transport uh, or, or uh, gas pipelines, and uh, to do that, we'll have to, uh, to change the framework for transport. Uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, we consider that the transport development in Mexico has been pretty good, and uh, has attracted uh, good investments, uh, has uh, created uh, some uh, gas pipelines, 
but uh, we need to change the framework if we want to uh, have a, a, a system that uh, gives redundancy or that attracts more investment. Uh, what is uh, the, the, the problem or what are the problems uh, of the current model that we have? Well, first, uh, of course, uh, uh, sometimes uh, the users have uh, forced the government to intervene in the market and uh, it has overrided the regulation and, uh, of course, that, uh, set, uh, that uh, means uh, some risks for a new investment. Fortunately, we're getting away from that. And the other thing is that... Uh, the current transport model is not the best option because uh, every new investment will have to be paid entirely by the new users, and uh, it doesn't recognize any externalities uh, that it uh, uh, brings to the current users of the, of the system. So uh, it's very expensive, and uh, it, of course, reduces the amount of new users that it can have. So we are uh, looking at uh, something like a rolling model that would recognize the positive externalities of uh, new investment. And um, besides that, we're working with the per, uh, current Pemex tariff model to solve some problems because it, uh, uh, it uh, leads to some uh, uh, transport arbitrage and uh, it is very complicated uh, uh, to implement because it has a very large number of zones. So what we are doing is we're working with the ministry. Uh, we will have a new national integrated uh, gas line uh, or gas pipeline system. And this system will comprehend both the uh, existing national pipeline system owned by Pemex and other interconnected private systems. And uh, rolling will be used to facilitate expansions and redundancy, of course. It has to be or any new investments that uh, are to be included in this national integrated system will have to be efficient and will have to uh, show that they bring positive externalities to the uh, current users. This is the general description, description of the model we'll have. Uh, currently, if, if you want to have a new pipeline, you have to pay the uh, tariff at the national pipeline system, and uh, plus that you have to pay uh, if you're a user located in an area, uh, the, the entire uh, tariff of the new private system. With this new model, what we would have is uh, two new charges, a national injection charge that would probably uh, recognize the benefits that uh, the new project gives to the existing users, and then we would have also a zone or ex extraction or transit charge that will be charged to the users on the zone that will be mostly benefit by this new investment. And uh, as I was saying, we will be reducing the number of zones. This will help to make a, a more transparent system, uh, uh, less uh, complicated. Uh, it has a price consistency. I won't get into these details. Uh, just, uh, they just show that it is price consistent. And this is an example of uh, how the uh, system works currently and how it will work. Currently, for instance, if, uh, if, if you're a user uh, that, uh, w uh, that want to have a gas, in, for instance, in, uh, in El Bajío, which is a zone in the center of Mexico, you pay the, the, uh, uh, the tariff uh, of, uh, of using the uh, national uh, pipeline system, and then you have uh, the uh, uh, private tariff. But uh, instead of that, what we will have is uh, different charges that will be uh, charged to the uh, all the users and to the local users. And as you can see, uh, instead of, uh, if you're a user in this zone, instead of paying 13.14 uh, uh, pesos uh, per gigajoule, uh, with the current system, we'll, you will be paying 8.84 uh, pesos. And if you're a user that are not located in that area, the only increase you will be facing is uh, going up from 8.53 to 8.84. And so this makes a huge difference, and uh, so uh, and it recognizes the benefits that uh, the new system will be bringing to the existing users. The other thing that uh, we are pushing is uh, uh, real open access to the uh, to the transfer system. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, industrial sector has opposed to open access because they have a very cheap uh, tariff uh, coming from the. Uh, uh, from the uh, from Pemex, so uh, we are convinced that we need this in order to promote and foster competition, in order to make the system work more efficiently. Okay, let me finish with the conclusions. 
I've tried to do it fast, but it's crazy. Okay, the demand uh, for natural gas in Mexico has been growing, and it will continue growing because uh, there's faster uh, gr growth in the demand than in the production. So we have to rely on LNG. Uh, the existing and proposed LNGs, uh, LNG projects will help to satisfy the existing demand in the uh, uh, demand growth both in the U.S. and in, the, in, Mexico, in Mexico. It will bring natural gas to zones in Mexico where there is no supply currently. It will also help to avoid uh, large fluctuations in price. And, uh, of course, it will require LNG projects. Uh, uh, and these LNG projects will require new pipelines in the zone. And uh, some other measures uh, could also help, like, for instance, exploiting the coal bath methane reserves. Of course, there are some other challenges, and I believe that the, uh, uh, the, the, the most important challenge is to openly discuss a legislative bill that would allow for more investment and competition in the upstream sector. Second, we have to stick to policies that allow prices to reflect market conditions and avoid price controls. Uh, we have to strengthen the regulator because sometimes uh, the regulation is override. And um, this implies that in the absence of, uh, absence of constitutional autonomy to the regulators, something similar to the Bank of Mexico, uh, the government should support regulatory measures that are aimed to promote an efficient use of infrastructure and secure new investments. And finally, we have to implement administrative measures adverse to unbundling of uh, monopolistic activities and competition within the state-owned companies. So with this, I finish, and if there are some questions, please go ahead. Yes. Um, with your new new uh, new approach, uh, you you laid out a number of new pipelines: uh, Naco to Hermosillo, down to Guadalajara. Uh, current bottleneck between uh, Juarez and Chihuahua. Will this help alleviate that that bottleneck? Yes, that's uh, another project that is considered under this model. Francisco, can you go back to your map of your proposed pipeline zones? Pipeline zones. Uh, yes, right there. Okay. I've been puzzling on the Manzanillo pricing mm -hmm. ever since it was announced. Well, I don't think I'm the only one. One of the things that I'm wondering about is whether the pricing formula might be intended in part to discourage movements of natural gas west via pipeline on a Henry Hub formula that we would that we would equate with that, Henry Hub Plus Transportation, mm -hmm. which would actually price the gas considerably higher than what the Manzanillo formula yields. So was that a factor in the thinking on that contract? No, but uh, let me tell you what, uh, we were not involved in the Manzanillo contract. Of course, that was a, a contract that was signed between uh, CFE and uh, Repsol. And that, that's the price for CFE. But according to our numbers, with the current, uh, with, with the new uh, tariffs for the transport system, that gas will be able to compete uh, with uh, gas coming from the south and gas coming from the north, and it will be able to compete uh, even at the center of the of the country. Uh, I don't know if, uh, it, but uh, it wasn't intended to do. Achieve the corollary, which is to get gas in cheap enough to actually set up the competitive pricing scheme that you all have been striving for all of these years. Yes. But, uh, and the Peruvians are willing to go along with that. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, they didn't have too, mo too many choices if they wanted to, <laughs> to deliver the gas. Yes. <laughs> but I don't know if, uh, of course that was not the intention, but it results that way. Okay, I think we're uh, ready for a coffee break. Okay. Thank you very much, Francisco. Uh